Well, before turning to our scripture passages this evening, I'll read from uh, the Shorter Catechism to questions and answers that we're considering tonight, primarily number 11, but that actually ties back to number 8. This is on page 968 in the Trinity Psalter hymnal. Number 8 is, how does God execute his decrees? God executes his decrees in the works of creation and providence. You have creation that we heard about and know that Genesis 1 summarizes for us, but then there's God's ongoing work, which we call his providence. And so question 11 asks, what are God's works of providence? God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. So as we consider that tonight, Let's turn to Genesis chapter 45. And we'll read verses 1 through 11. Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 11. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried, Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please, come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father. And say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you. For there are still five years of famine to come, and you and your household and all that you have would be impoverished. And then we'll turn to the New Testament. Just a few verses from the great sermon in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. This is the Apostle Peter preaching. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you, nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. 
take just one more moment to pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the word made flesh. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who was sent at Pentecost and continues to work among us. We ask for your triune blessing upon us now as we gather before your word to be taught by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been working through the catechisms one at a time each week, more or less one at a time, and it's always helpful just to stop and think about what we have in catechism questions and answers. They are many confession of faiths or profession of faiths. They're a little bit different than um, Scripture itself, or maybe very different in that it's not the inspired Word of God, but humans coming together and saying, when we take into account all of these different inspired verses and words from God, this is what we believe it's teaching. Here is a summary of what we believe God's Word is teaching as we consider it together. So we go from topic to topic, and it's helpful to stop and realize that behind each one of these catechism questions, no matter how many texts we read, there are all sorts of scripture verses, just verse upon verse upon verse, so to speak, behind each one of these questions and answers. And you've seen that when it comes to creation, we can just open up to Genesis chapter 1 and see all sorts of uh, verses related to God executing his decree of creation just by looking at Genesis chapter 1. But when we come to this topic of providence, everything since God created all things, God sustaining and upholding all things, well, we actually go to all sorts of verses throughout all of Scripture to find that. And what's interesting is that in the Orthodox Presbyterian churches, Westminster Shorter Catechism, there's many proof texts there, and um, I think it's very helpful to uh, stop and, and consider those and read those. I'll read a few of them for you. You know, just considering that this is not just theologians coming up with what they believe, but it is um, Christians, pastors, elders, divines, theologians doing their best to summarize what we find in Scripture. So Psalm 145, verse 17 says, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. In everything the Lord does, he is holy. Psalm 104, 24. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them. The earth is full of your riches. In Ephesians 1, 19-22. What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. We see these magnificent expressions of God's authority, of God's power. We began our worship with a call to worship from Romans that speaks about that. And we know that Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth, said, the very hairs of your heads are numbered. Indeed, a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground apart from the will of God in heaven. And you're, you're of much more worth than a sparrow. Proverbs 16.33 says it this way, the lot is cast into the lap but the whole disposing is of the Lord. Maybe we think about dice instead of lots, but, you know, the whole idea of casting a lot or throwing a dice is sort of, quote-unquote, letting chance determine what comes about, and the author of Proverbs is saying, that whatever the dice says, whatever the lot determines, ultimately it's God who brings about whatever comes to pass. All of those are good references. Believe me, there are many more. But I can't help but hear those and just think they don't include the best reference, the best scripture text. I'm sure this is 
personal and autobiographical, but to be honest, if I had to pick one scripture verse to draw out the glory of God's sovereignty, of his providence, that he is in control of all things, it would be this very well-known verse from Romans 8. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And what I want you to think about is how Paul begins that. He doesn't say, and we believe God causes all things to work together for good, or we really wish that God will work everything together for good. We think he might work all things together for good. Not even we hope he'll work all things together. We know that he causes all things together to work for good for those whom he has called according to his purpose. We know. Why would Paul say it like that? We know, certainly we believe, we hope, we wish, all those things. But Paul says, we know God works all things together for good. And I think he can say it like that in part because he's already shown that to be the case. If you think about when Romans comes in the Bible, it's entirely after the Old Testament, which was our first reading from tonight, Genesis 45. It's after the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And that's uh, when Peter preaches his sermon at Pentecost. And it's, it's after that that Paul is writing. And what I'd like for us to do tonight as we consider God's providence is that way he begins Romans 8.28. We know. We know he works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So we'll look first at Joseph and then at Jesus. Genesis 45, 1 through 11, then Acts 2, 22 to 24. And before we um, go into considering Joseph, let's just start thinking a little bit about this word at the middle of our catechism answer today. Providence. Providence. Not luck. Not dumb luck. Not fate. Not blind fate. Not chance. Not random, meaningless evolution. Providence. Of course, there's dark providences involved with every life. But providence. What is that word made up of? You can't even spell it without writing the word provide first. And God himself in the Old Testament, Genesis 22, is called God our providence, or God who provides, Jehovah Jireh. And as you read the entirety of Scripture, whether it's Joseph or any other narrative, you just see over and over, because God is in control, because he is these things that we have in the 11th answer of the Shorter Catechism, because he is most holy, most wise, and most powerful, because he's all-powerful, all-knowing, in control of all things, but also all-wise and all-good, He's providing over and over and over for, through, for his people in ways that we cannot provide for ourselves and we cannot provide for one another. So we see that providence written large throughout Scripture, and we certainly see it in the life of Joseph. And before looking at uh, verse 45, uh, chapter 45, which I think is so helpful for us, as I hope you'll see too, you know, just remember the, the story of Joseph. If you grew up in a Christian home, you've heard this story from a very young age, even secular movies, uh, Joseph, dreamer of dreams. Um, speak to the narrative here about Joseph. It's really the, the way the end of the book of Genesis occurs is through the narrative of Joseph and considering what goes on there. And it's just a remarkable story. I mean, uh, Joseph, dreamer of dreams, um, has these dreams of greatness, right? Like he has these dreams that indicate his own 
brothers who are older than him are going to bow down to him. He doesn't have the good sense to keep that to himself. But that's what happens. And you just imagine, I mean, if you've lived through teenage years and young adulthood, you know what it is to have those great hopes and ambitions and to sort of dream big and, and apply yourself to things. And in Joseph's case, he had these dreams and they seem to indicate, like, you're, you're going to be great. You're an amazing person. The Lord has a lot in store for you. You're like, your own older brothers are going to bow down to you. Imagine what that would do to someone in that stage of life. And then for that to f- be followed by something that, like, you know, death would be better, right? Right? Your brothers, your siblings, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh, people that are, should be closer than friends, they're so aggravated, they hate you so much, they throw you in a well, wishing you death, but then make a profit on you by selling you to foreigners into slavery? And that's just like the beginning of the story when it comes to Joseph. Joseph. Because he is sold into slavery. Psalm 105, verse 18, says that this was, you know, no joke. This wasn't like a euphemism. There was iron around his neck and fetters for his feet, probably manacles for his hands. This is ancient slavery in a foreign land, Egypt. And we learn he was an amazing slave and, and sort of rose the ranks in Potiphar's house only to be betrayed and thrown in prison. And we know, like, prison is not a fun thought. There are many people who are more afraid of prison than they are of dying. And this wasn't just, you know, 2024 prison. It was a foreign prison, an ancient prison, a prison in enemy territory, and apparently the sort of prison that slaves would be sent to. Neck irons, fetters, prison, betrayal, enslavement. Then we come to Genesis 45. (laughs) And it's, you know, just a glorious turning point. Of course, those early dreams have been realized because the brothers have indeed bowed down before Joseph, seeking food from him and his exalted status in Egypt. But just think of that prison, slavery, betrayed, left for dead, then sold into slavery, cut off from your family members, not just prison, but foreign prison, ancient prison. And look at how Joseph summarizes that seven times, beginning in verse 5 of chapter 45 in Genesis. God sent me. That is quite the interpretation. Not, I was sold into slavery, and then I was thrown into prison, and I had steel or irons around my neck and my feet. God sent me. My brothers, they hated me. They were so jealous. They left me for dead. Then they made a profit off of me. God sent me. That's verse 5. Then look at verse 7. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth. Look at verse 8. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me. You sold me into slavery. (laughs) And because of that, I ended up in Egypt and in prison. But you didn't send me. That wasn't you. That was God. He used what you did, and he was sending me. God sent me. God made me a father to Pharaoh. God made me lord of Pharaoh's household. God made me a ruler over the land of Egypt. Verse 9, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. 
seven different ways in those verses between uh, 45 verse 5 and 45 verse 9 in which Joseph says, you have to see what's going on here. You meant evil against me, as he'll say at the end of the book. But God meant it for good. Your evil was the way God sent me here to arrange preservation, to provide, to give providence to you, his people. And I'm calling your attention to this because, in a, you know, in a sense where we, we started with all things work together for good, Romans 8.28, we know that. And we're working back towards that. We have that now in the distance. That will be the conclusion of the sermon. But you start seeing it here. It's not we hope, we wish, but from Paul's perspective, think back on Genesis 45. This has already been demonstrated to you. He'll take what is the worst and use it for what is best. He'll take even evil and use it for good. He does this throughout history. He did it in the life of Joseph. And this providence, this providing, has a transcendent quality to it. When you interpret your life through the lens of this providence, instead of saying, you terrible, wicked, horrible brothers, you sold me into slavery because you didn't want to do the dirty work of offing me. Instead of focusing on that, instead of being embittered by that, instead of being crushed by that, you look at that and you say, God sent me. God was at work even in that. Even human sin, the worst of the worst, isn't beyond his providence. He puts it to work. He uses it in a remarkable way. Now, I know that this topic becomes, um, well, it's not for the squeamish. <laughs> God is in control of all things. And all we need to do is watch the news and say, but that's perplexing. How can a holy, wise, all-powerful, all-knowing God be in control when bad things happen, when there's slavery, when there's prison, when there's injustice? And we start making objections. I want to just speak, you know, very quickly to some of those objections. And I don't want to tr treat them um, in any way tritely or dismissively. But maybe just give you two ways uh, to think about them. Because I think this answer in the Shorter Catechism even gets to that by saying his holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. It doesn't say God's providence is that he's in control of everything all the time. That's not the answer. It's more full than that. There's more given to us than that. The way in which he's providence, the, uh, the way in which he provides, the way in which all things work together, the way in which he's in control of all things is holy, wise, and powerful. So let's think about that. Because there's things going on there. He's all-powerful, and he's all-knowing. Now, how good would the Word of God really be if he wasn't all-powerful or all-knowing? I, I, I think you can maybe get into over-parsing these sorts of things, but it seems like those things are very related. He's all-knowing because he's all-powerful. He's all-powerful, and so he can speak to that in an all-knowing way. He's not um, like us. There isn't like a threat of a, a bigger entity or creature or more powerful thing coming along that dethrones him and throws him off track. That can't happen when it comes to God. If it could, his word wouldn't mean what it means to us. So he is in control of all things. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful, but he's also all-good. It's not like somehow, you know, he becomes capricious and malicious and hateful and spiteful because he's in control of everything. There's certainly mystery here. How is he one and three and three and one? How is he infinite, eternal, and unchangeable when we're finite, changeable, and in space? But let's remember those things. He's all good. 
He's not only all good, he's all wise. He's working these things together for good in wisdom and goodness while also being in control of all things. And I don't know if this illustration is helpful for you. It's helpful for me. When it comes to God, people are constantly thinking of ways to get around this. Maybe the most typical one is, well, you know, God is good, but he's not necessarily in control of all different things. He doesn't want bad things to happen to good people. That's beyond his control. But look at what's happening there. Instead of saying he's um, all-powerful, you're saying he's very limited, but he's so very good. That doesn't, that shouldn't do much for you. You know, if you could look at a snail and say, this snail is just so very wonderful. A snail is full of virtue and, and goodness. It wouldn't really comfort you at all in life because the snail is absolutely powerless to do anything for you. But God is all powerful and all good. Don't let anybody take you that away from you. Now, here's the illustration. Think of a, you know, a flight of stairs. And imagine how foolish it would be for someone to look at a flight of 16 stairs and say, you know what? I only want the top three. 14, 15, and 16. That's the only stairs I care about. They're the ones that get you to the top floor, after all. That's a ludicrous idea. Those stairs would be absolutely worthless. Because it takes stairs one, two, three, four, five, six to make the top stairs get you to where you need to go. And I think there's something going on there with God. The stairs are his infinitude, his unchangingness, his boundlessness, his eternity, his omniscience, his all-knowingness, his all-wiseness, his all-goodness, his all-holiness, and his all-powerfulness. But you can't just take the top three stairs and boil, you know, dilute down what foreknowledge means or any other biblical term and sort of skate by with just that. It won't do. You need this sort of God. Here's the other objection that comes up all the time. Maybe not as abstract of an illustration as the, the stairs. It's like, doesn't this make me into a robot? Doesn't this make humans into a robot? God's in control of all things. Everything, right, is the outworking of his will. He not only preserves, but governs all his creatures and all their actions. So we must be robots, right? God's the marionette in heaven just sort of moving, and it's that that takes place. But this one's actually even simpler to deal with and less abstract, oddly enough. If you had lunch today, you probably served as a wonderful illustration of how to go about this objection and question. You probably had lunch today. And you probably prayed before that lunch and said something like, Dear Lord, thank you for providing this meal. Thank you for your providence in bringing me to the point where I get to enjoy this provision from your hands. And what you didn't do is come to 1 o'clock or 1.30 whenever you got to lunch and say, I don't know what's coming over me, but I can't help it. I'm going to have to eat. I can't help taking this food and putting it in my mouth and picking up this cup of water and drinking it. That didn't happen. You were free. The Lord was in complete control, even to the extent that you said, Lord, thank you for this water. Thank you for this food. Thank you for your provision. And yet, from your experiential point of view, you took what you wanted to eat. You put it in your mouth. You chewed. You drained a cup of water. At each instance, you were exercising a liberty, even though God was completely sovereign over all of that. He provides. We're not robots. He's a transcendent God beyond our comprehension and understanding, whether it comes to his triunity or the fact that he's in control and bad things still happen. But we know all things work together for good. And I love this about Scripture, you know. 
we see even in the Joseph story, Genesis 45, that Joseph's understanding of the providence of God doesn't bring him to bitterness over his brothers and circumstances, but ultimately to a place of rest and joy and faith and hope and love. And if the Lord God does that through Joseph, how much more does he do it through Jesus? And throughout the whole scripture, we kind of come to this phenomenon of like God outdoing himself. Like here's a little picture of what God can do. Jo Joseph, Genesis 45. Here's God in the flesh and what he accomplishes. Acts 2, 22 to 24, what we read before. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death. Look what you have there. Do you see the Joseph story sort of written larger, outdone, in a magnificent, glorious way? God taking what men meant for evil and using it for a good so good, it's called the gospel across the world, even today, almost 2,000 years later. God himself, God himself came and lived among us. He lived thanking God for God the Father's providential care over his life, even though that providential care brought him to the cross. And at the cross, you have the worst of the worst the only sinless man to have ever lived, suffering the death of the worst of sinners, the only one who deserved the favor, favor of God, enduring the wrath of God. Why? The worst of the worst, the evil of evil, the most evil of evil, hell on earth, Bring about what's best. God raised them up again, putting an end to the agony of death. And you see it there. This was according to God's plan. That's why we have prophecies about it throughout the Old Testament. That's why Jesus knew all about it his life and then spoke about that coming hour and prophesied that he would go to Jerusalem and that he would die on the cross. He knew that was coming because it was according to the predetermined plan of God, and yet it was carried out by lawless men, godless men, men who were sinning and putting him to death. And that worst thing, the most evil thing, the most horrible thing we could ever consider is used of God to be the very best thing, what we call good news, that Jesus Christ went to the cross for sinners like you and me so that we might receive forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of God in Christ because he was indeed obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Let's stop there just to appreciate for a moment again the good news of this before we apply this to the ins and outs of every last moment of our lives, right at the center of all that you claim to be as a Christian involves God taking even evil things and bringing good out of them. God taking even malicious, evil, sinister, hateful, conspiratorial thoughts of men and using them according to his own plan to bring about good news. There's no salvation like this. Trust in this Lord Jesus Christ, put to death by godless men, 
according to the plan of God. And in doing that, in securing salvation, in providing this justification by faith alone through the work that Christ did on the cross, the atoning death, overcoming death, and the agony of death by rising again. Look at what Christ has done for every last moment of your specific life and existence and experience. Listen to what Hebrews 12, verses 2 through 4 say. It's the end of the book of Hebrews. Actually, I'll start at the end of verse 1 and then through verse 3. Hebrews 12, really the middle of verse 1. Lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You see what that's doing? I mean, it's saying, it, it's, he came, he lived among us. He endured suffering and trial and difficulty, man of sorrows, what a name. It pleased the Lord to bruise him to lay on him the iniquities of us all. And from that cross, he endured for the joy set before him. He was able to, in some way, even while crying out, God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was still able to be obedient unto death, the death of the cross, enduring the pain, the agony, the grief, the sorrow. And this verse says, consider that. Verse 3, chapter 12. Consider that hostility at the hands of sinners. All that was against him. So that you, in your life, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, you don't lose heart. God endured that in Jesus Christ. And he was able to persevere for the joy set before him. He so knew that God would work all things together for good. He endured the cross itself, despising its shame. And the author of Hebrews and the Holy Spirit, the ultimate author of Hebrews, says, don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. Look to the cross that's at the center of your salvation. Look to the Christ who endured that cross, despising the shame. And evaluate your life. What are you going through? The loss of loved ones? Death? Grief? Illness? Sin that brings forth death? Sad news, grievous news, all the things that upset us and keep us up at night. The Bible, God says, don't lose heart. I've taken the worst of the worst and I use it for good. What you celebrate as good news came from the evil of evils. So you see, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Jehovah Jireh, God our providence, God who provides. We know he works all things together for good. Father in heaven, thank you so much. As much as we love our catechism questions and answers, we are so thankful that we derive even them from 
salvation history, redemptive history, stories that are true stories, but also teach us about our God, stories that furnish us with abounding hope to the extent that even as we reflect on your word, we can say, we know this, our God is the one who works all things together for good. He did it in Joseph, did it supremely in Jesus Christ. We pray that by your spirit that would inform every situation represented in this very room tonight. Help us to trust in you as holy, wise, good, all-powerful, and all-knowing, our loving God, Father, and Good Shepherd. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.